Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, let's go to God in a quick word of prayer. Father God, thank you so, so much for this time. Thank you for your word that we're about to look into and uh, get some direction for our lives. Love you a lot. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's awesome to see each and every one of you guys here today. Uh, today we're going to be looking at parables 29 and 30. So if you're new or visiting, we are going through a parable series. Um, and uh, I know last week you saw that parable that we covered was parable 31. So we kind of made a mistake, uh, but instead we're going to cover 29 and 30 today. And that is the parable of the lo uh, lost sheep, which is in Luke 15, and also the lost coin. Come on. You know, it's always encouraging to worship with the family. Amen. I don't know if you feel the same way, but to worship God together as a family is amazing. And I think uh, as I was uh, prepared to come up here and preach, I thought, I thought about life, right? Life is unfair, isn't it? It's especially unfair when you have to preach after two fiery lessons from Brian um, that is now officially landed in Crouching Tiger 2 and has started the church there. Can we give a round of applause for Brian and Millie? And I thought that was the only unfair thing. And then uh, Paul had to come up and do that. I was like, I think that's enough for the sermon, you know. <laughs> Just give your iPhones and your Nintendo Switch. Let's go home. But uh, I also do want to lift up the women. What an incredible event that was yesterday. I say it's incredible. I'm sorry I wasn't there. But in the words of Dr. Joe Willis, it was the best one yet. So give a round of applause to all the women. You guys have done a great job. You know, I hope you have risen since yesterday, women. And I'm not talking about physically, I'm talking about spiritually. I hope the men in this room have risen spiritually. Whether you have or have not, I have a question to ask you. Are you going in the wrong direction? Whoa. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Come on, Sorry, this is the only passage that you won't find in your notes. The notes have been emailed out, but turn to Matthew chapter 7. Come on, come on, Scotty. Are you going in the wrong direction? Come on, babe. You know, in London, England, 2010, a London Irish boy band was born. <laughs> They quickly became the first in the U.S. Billboard 200 history to have their first four albums debut and number one. They went on tour and eventually became the highest gross revenue tour by a vocal group in all of history. Sold over 70 million records worldwide, making them one of the best selling boy bands of all time. This group is called One Direction. Yet in 2015, one of the members left. Some people joke that he was insane. A year later, sadly, the group fell apart. You see, it wasn't the right direction. In season 16 of America's Got Talent, 2021, another boy band was born. They auditioned and immediately won the approval of people and the judges. They declared themselves to be the gayest boy band in the world. And in preparing to take over One Direction, they called themselves The Other Direction. After that, sadly, they were eliminated. They didn't win. See, it was the wrong direction. Come on. Now, we may laugh at that, but I got to ask you, are you going the wrong direction? Come on. There is no one direction. There is no other direction. There's only the only direction, and that is Jesus. You know, Jesus is the only direction that is needed in this world. Come on. Preach it. It's the only direction for hope. In this world, on, it's the only direction to a better marriage. Come on. It's the only direction to heal your broken heart Come on. or to soften your hardened heart, whether it's through sin or experiences in life. It's the only direction to heaven. Come on. 
In Matthew 7, verse 13 yeah. to 14, the Bible says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Yeah. I don't know about you, but have you ever, you know, taken a wrong turn or found yourself in a place that you did not expect to find yourself in? Yeah. You know, maybe you were driving in a car and you made the wrong turn or too early of a turn or late of a turn and you got into the wrong direction. Or maybe you went on the wrong bus or train. I know I experienced that this week. <laughs> and it can be time consuming and also expensive. It can be frustrating and it can mess up your life or the lives of others. You know, the scripture here in Matthew 7 is clear that most people are heading in the wrong direction. Yeah. You know, marriages today is heading in the wrong direction. Morality is heading in the wrong direction. Yeah. 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 Education is heading in the wrong direction. You know, it's so interesting, a couple, maybe I think last week or a couple of weeks ago, my Bible talk and I, we talked about educating the heart. And it was interesting because everyone in that Bible talk agreed that what we learn at university is not enough to deal with life. Come on. It's the greatest university is life. But a greater university than life is Jesus Christ. Come on. Uh, but everyone agreed. We are taught and educated on our intellect, but we don't know how to deal with our hearts. Right. You know, even most self-professing Christians today are heading in the wrong direction. Come on. You know, I was doing a little bit of research and I found on uh, the Global News article, uh, by, uh, they wrote an article um, about uh, United Nations and the United Nations Secretary General, his name was Antonio Guterres or something like that. You, you might know if you're from South America or something like that. <laughs> but he said, I quote, after decades of decline in poverty, hunger, gender inequality, risk from nuclear war, and climate breakdown, it is again on the rise. And he goes, it's so bad that we have to be concerned about it. Yeah. And he then goes on and talks about COVID and he says, COVID did nothing to us. It only just revealed who we truly are. It revealed how separated this world is. It revealed how selfish this world is. And as a result, the world is going in the wrong direction. Come on. But I believe no one wants to take a wrong turn, right? right. And I believe that's why you're here this morning. Because you're not sure about direction ahead, but you don't want to turn the wrong direction. You know, some people do turn the wrong direction initially because they thought it was the right one. Others do because they simply stop paying attention. Well. You know, you got to ask yourself, do either of these descriptions describe you spiritually today? Mm. Does it describe you spiritually today? You know, one of my favorite uh, artists, don't laugh at me, but Haley Steinfeld, right? <laughs> I don't know, I think she's good, right? <laughs> she's an accomplished singer, an actress, and a model which some of us in this room want to be. Amen? <laughs> but she said in a song that she wrote titled The Wrong Direction, in the last very bit of her song, the lyrics go like this. Love me with your worst intentions. That's what wrong directions do for you. They just only have wrong intentions, right? right. Worst. Didn't even stop to question. Are you questioning where you're going today? Every time you burn me down, don't know how, for a moment, it felt like heaven. And that's how all wrong directions go, start off, right? Oh, yeah. It feels like heaven for a moment, even though it's burning you from the inside out. Love me with your worst intentions. Painted us a happy ending. Wow. Every time you burn me down, don't know how, for a moment, it felt like heaven. And the last two lines, she goes, and it's so gut-wrenching, falling in the wrong 
direction. Come on. I mean, don't you just have those moments where you're like, why on earth did I make that decision? It's like, holy heck, why did I even dance like that? Why did I even move my head like this? Some of us, we get so embarrassed by things like that. You know, I know a couple of weeks ago, uh, Megan and Solomon got married. And I remember uh, Brandon came up to me and goes, man, you were going out to town, man. And I remember just thinking, holy moly, that was embarrassing, right? But that's a minor example. Some of us, we were going, man, why did I even give my heart to the wrong person? Why did I make that decision? Why did I go here? Only to find ourselves in a gut-wrenching position because we are in the wrong direction. Point number one, are you on the run? Come on. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 15. Come on, Scotty. Are you on the run? Where are you running from? Where are you running to? Who are you running from? What are you running from and why are you running from it? Some questions that you need to sit down and ask yourself. But in Luke chapter 15, we'll start from verse 3 to 7. It says, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep! I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. We'll stop right there. You know, very often when we talk about this parable of the lost sheep, we talk about Jesus or God being the person going to seek out for the lost sheep. And that's true. But today I want to focus on a sheep that was lost itself. You know, sinning makes us run from God and from people. You know, I appreciate uh, you've heard some great sermons over the past two weeks from Brian. But I, uh, one of the examples of stories that he shared that I remember the most, he said uh, when Joe came to America, he uh, decided to he turned into a ninja, you know. And some of us are smiling because we're like that, right? We, we go, you know, we just like dodge. We go here, there, then we try to, and he goes, I was trying to dodge Joe the whole time. But it makes you weird. You know, one night he was Brian, and the next morning he became a ninja. For some of us, We're great last night. We come to church and we're super moody. We're super emotional. But that's what sin does in our lives. Come on. You know, Jesus told previous two parables about sheep. That's in Matthew 18, 12 to 14, and John chapter 10. In the first one, he talks about sheep to be children, the little ones. You know, they are the seekers. The second one, he talks about sheep being the followers of Christians. Now, in this parable, he's referring to the sinner, as in the lost, or the followers that end up drifting. But it makes you think, what does the word sin even mean? Because I think a lot of us feel like we know what sin is, or can understand what sin is, but we don't know how to explain what sin really is. You know, sin is a term used mainly in religious contexts to describe an act that violates a moral rule. Sin is often used to mean an action that is prohibited or considered wrong in some religions. Notably, no, uh, notably sorry, some sects of Christianity. You know, they refer to as sin can refer to a state of mind rather than a specific action. Mm. And it goes along the lines of like any thought or the word or the act considered immoral, shameful, harmful, anything that may feel like that, it's considered sin. However, in biblical Christianity, sin is portrayed and not, as not following God's moral guidance based on the accounts of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. That's where you know, this sin all started from. And when we read into it, we find that they disobeyed God by eating the fruits of the tree of the, good, uh, sorry, of the knowledge of good and evil that God told them not to do. Thus, this moment, they acted in complete disobedience, thinking they would become like gods 
um, like God himself, and that was sin. You know, it's a very interesting. I don't know if you guys considered this as well. But ever wondered why the sin is called the sin of Adam rather than the sin of Eve? Right? Because Eve was the first one that took the fruit. Now, I'm not trying to target any women here, but I'm just saying. It's called the sin of Adam. Because I believe it wasn't really the fact that sin committed, uh, sorry, uh, Eve committed the sin, the sin. I believe that she was deceived in committing the sin. However, Adam committed a greater sin by not being deceived. He saw what was going on and did nothing about it. Come on. You see, sin sometimes is not what you do. It's what you don't do. The good that you know and you don't do it. Come on. I think we live in a world where we place sin down as something not very tragic. Yeah. You see, but when we really think about it, everyone would agree that, hey, if you had the cure for cancer and did not share it, you'd be like, man, that is an evil, evil person. Right. I would say nothing has destroyed this world more than sin. Yeah. Nothing has taken lives more than sin. Nothing has separated more marriages than sin. Nothing has destroyed more families than sin. Nothing has created more orphans. Nothing is more destructive than a nuclear bomb than sin. I believe it's why New South Wales lost against, uh, you know, Queensland. It wasn't because of Queensland. New South Wales just sinned, you know. Anyways, the origins today, all the best to you supporters. I love New South Wales. But you got to understand, guys, sin knows no bounds. It has no limits. No age limit. It can catch you at 18. It can catch you at 80. It is not racist, nor it cares about gender. It is independent of your financial status and marital status. It doesn't care who you support, whether New South Wales or Queensland. Sin will find you, and you've got to deal with it. You know, sometimes we fear people more than we fear our sin. That's true. You know, I hear people getting afraid to talk to their parents about being disciples. You know, telling their parents, sorry, I'm going to follow God more than following what the family says. You know, sin will either destroy your life now or it will destroy your life at some point in the future. That's, yeah. true. That's what you need to be afraid of. Yeah. I am afraid of who I am by my own physical nature. I am afraid of my sinful flesh. I am afraid of how much of a sexual perverted man I am. That without the Bible, without prayer... And without people to help me see my sin and repent of it, I would probably be at this point hurting so many people, destroying my own soul, and, pre and most likely would be contemplating suicide right now. And I think that was the time that really changed me when I was challenged to study the Bible. I ran away, you know, uh, like most of us are on the run. And... I think I got to a point where I was having so many issues with what's going on in my heart. I had relationship problems. I had problems with my uni. Um, I had problems everywhere. And for the first time, I sat down on my bed, and for the first time, I had an inkling in my mind to think about committing suicide. Now, if you know me very well, I'm a happy, chappy type of guy, you know? I, I love to throw a ball around and just joke around and blast some music and just love life, right? And I remember just sitting at the edge of my bed, and that thought came to my mind, and I, it shocked the life out of me. Just going, whoa. How did I even get to that point? I didn't know where I was running, but I knew that the only direction I needed to run was towards God. And thankfully, that direction landed me in the arms of Joe and Chi. Pretty hard and tough directions and, you know, arms. But I embraced it, you know. I was like, I am here. I'm running towards God. Doesn't, mean, doesn't matter if it hurts. But in 1 John chapter 3, talking about sin, right? Come on. It says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. You know, the Greek word in the New Testament that is translated as sin, it comes from the word hamatia, which literally means missing the mark or missing the target. Now, we may go, oh, well, what is the law? There's so much to read. Well, Jesus simplified it in Matthew 22, verse 36 to 40. It says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets 
hang on these two commandments. He goes, that's really what the law is. If you just focus on loving God and loving people, that's all you need. You know, that's about it. I think sometimes we can focus on so many things that we end up not focusing on the one thing that matters and miss everything. And totally miss everything. You know, we were talking also on Friday as a Bible talk. One of the things I realized being here in Sydney is that I'm surprised at how many people in Sydney do not have a purpose in life. They take other people's purpose to be their purpose, like their parents telling them, hey, go get a degree, make some money, and that's it. So many people, I go out and share my faith on campus, and I go, hey, what do you study? And they go, oh, mechanical engineering. And they either go, and I either go, uh, hey, why mechanical engineering? They either go, uh, I don't know. Or they go, oh, because I love cars. And then I go, well, what are you planning to do with that in the future? They go, I don't know. I don't really know. And it's no wonder why people end up clueless, spinning out of control, and then committing suicide. Because there's no real purpose. You know why? Because no one really knows what they want. True. You're here this morning because you don't know what you want. You think you do, but you don't know what you want. Come on. And I remember just telling my Bible talk, the reason why people have a purpose when they place it in Jesus Christ is because God knows exactly what he wants. Come on. Knows exactly what he's going for. And he's immovable on it. Whereas for us, we go, oh, well, my parents thought this. Oh, I, oh, I feel like, oh, well, this person felt like I just hurt this other person. You know, and we just get so confused. We're like, what do I really want? <laughs> Jesus will tell you what you really want. You know, if you're here and you're studying the Bible, I want to encourage you. Don't go running. Right. Don't be like this one Simon guy I know who studied the Bible and ran away for a year, you know? Oh. What, what's up with the Simons? Maybe it's the islanders, right? Amen. Uh, anyways, but you've got to take it seriously and go, wh- who are you running from? Are you running away from yourself? It's time to face your sin. Face the Bible. And go, I want to run to the direction the Bible tells me to. Some of us have been around church for about a year. For about more than that. Some of you guys, when I was failing uni, I saw you guys and now I see you again this morning. <laughs> right? I did well. I got an engineering degree. So, you know, round of applause, right? But in all seriousness, guys, Stop running. It's time to stop running. It's time to get serious about life. Because at some point, life will catch up with you. Come on. Point number two, and our last and final point. Are you a little lost? Well. Are you a little lost? Or you're really lost? You know, whether you think you're a little lost, you're still lost. Yeah. In Luke chapter 15, verse 8, it says, Oh, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know, God is earnestly looking for you. God is earnestly looking for you. You know, it's amazing here when you look at how how precious this coin is to this woman. She had to organize her whole house, move everything around just to find this one coin where she had other nine coins. You know, people ask, well, why was it so hard to look for it? What was so special about it? Well, the lost coin was either a Greek dragma or a Roman denarius, each worth about an average day's wages. In those days, the Near Eastern houses, were freak, uh, they were frequently made with no windows and only like earthen floors. Like there weren't any tiles or any carpets or anything like that. It was just pure dust. Uh, most of it was dirt. Making the search for the single coin very difficult. So we ask ourselves, what is the point that Jesus is trying to make here? He goes, God is earnestly seeking for you. Yeah. And I think for some of us, it's a good insight that we can grab for ourselves in saving many other people. Whereas we know we've lost the coin, we clean up our own house first, right? Have our quiet times, get right with God, make sure our marriages are good and our homes are good, and then we deal with finding the lost. You know, I want to lift up all the baptisms that we've had, the special Hannah, Vicky, and also Brooke. Can we have a round of applause for each and every one of them? 
You know, it's so amazing. I, I, I congratulate you guys on this journey you've started. But this is only the beginning. Yeah. Uh, you guys are special, and, uh, and uh, I'm so excited to see you guys make the most important decision in your life. What an incredible um, pledge to God. But I think it's been a privilege for myself uh, just working with Brooke a lot more. Um, and uh, it was interesting because we had a, we, we've been studying the Bible with Brooke for about a month, almost about two months. And I got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm doing my best, but I don't know how to help this guy. And then uh, we brought him to Joe, right? And Joe was like, you know, being the loving Joe he is, um, you know, just getting to know him. And then right from there, it was just like earth-shattering stuff. It was just like, we, we were like sitting there, me, Paul, and Brandon were sitting there going, is the study for Brooke or is the study for us? <laughs> you know how when, you just, when a study just rocks your soul, right? You're just like, I think I need to redo Light and Darkness. <laughs> and it was just, and, and Brooke just broke down. And the moment I knew Brooke, Brooke was ready, the day, next, the day after and the day after that, we kept praying. And the thing he said was, God, thank you for pointing out who I really am. And he goes, thank you for giving me a way out. Amen. Amen. And once I heard those words, I'm like, he's got it. He's ready. He knows it. And for the first time in his life, he didn't, con he didn't even think uh, the whole thing was mean or he didn't think Joe was too harsh. He was just like, I am grateful. Someone pointed out to me who I am, right. where I'm at, the damage my sin will do to my soul and the people that I will love in the future. Right. And he goes, I am grateful. I am even more grateful to have a way out. Maybe you're here today and you're trying to look for a way out. Come on. I don't know what you're in. I don't know what issues you're in. But everyone is searching for a way out. You can move different countries. You can change your job. You can have more money. You can get new relationships. It'll never give you a way out. It'll never. Only Jesus will give you a way out. You know, the other very, um, when I think about my life, the other very um, defining points in my life, before I, be before I became a Christian, that was the defining point where I just realized I need to stop running away from who I truly am and go face my sin and go face God and go, I want to change. Um, the second point was, I believe it was about 2020. And I think it was the first ever year that I ever felt so strongly about falling away. Maybe some of you guys feel strongly about that. And I, and I felt so strongly and I just like, I don't know what was going on, but I was trying to, like I knew I was in sin but then you know how when you're in sin and then you kind of convince yourself that you're not really in sin? You know what I mean? Like, or maybe you were in sin because of this, so it wasn't really your fault. And I got to that point and, and I remember just thinking to myself, like, man, I can't remember the last time I prayed. And then I went and prayed and had my quiet time. For, if you're new visiting, a quiet time is we pray and uh, spend time with Jesus and reading the Bible. And I prayed and I read. And then in 2021, I felt a lot better and I realized I've been reading a lot more. 2021, everything was going well, and I was like, okay, I'm ready to, you know, kickstart, and this is going to be a different year for me. And then uh, Joe and Kerry had a conversation with both of us, and I realized, wow, I was still a long way off. I was a lot better, but I was still a long way off. And then I came here, I realized, man, I am still, I am really a long way off. And the past couple of weeks, I've been... Uh, Reflecting on, so I have a quiet time book, and every time I write down what I learn from the Bible, I firstly write down a date. Today is the 20 something, you know, today is the 20 this and that. Uh, by the way, today is my sixth spiritual birthday, I just remember. <laughs> and I remember going through my quiet time book, and I was, and I was kind of thinking, like, why haven't I really exploded off the blocks and really been on fire for God? And I've been going through my quiet time books and I realized just how many entries that I had that weren't there. Like there were days where I missed a quiet time. I didn't even write the date down, which meant I didn't even have a quiet time. And I thought I did. And then I went backwards a bit. I realized, man, I missed one quiet time last week. And then the week before that, I missed like two. And then I went back way in the beginning of the year and I realized I missed about five quiet times within a week. But it's so easy to drift, you know? You think you're okay, and you think you're a little lost, but then you realize and you look at the facts and go, man, I am totally lost. 
You know, when we look at this passage, we ask the question, who is Jesus speaking to? It was the totally lost and the people that thought they weren't lost. Come on. You know, you may be here going, oh, I don't really need, I don't think I'm that lost. You are totally lost. If you are a little lost, you are completely lost. Yeah. And I want to encourage everyone today. You know, ask yourself, when was the last time you had a really heartfelt prayer with God? Mm. Or even your quiet times? And I have a practical for everyone. I want you guys to, when you have your quiet times moving for write the date down. That will help you go back. Because I believe that most people fall away, not because of what someone else did, but because they just didn't go to God. Come on. Just didn't go to God. That's true. We, Jen and I just arrived from Samoa about a, week, a month ago. And I found out that, you know, about 12, over the three years that we baptized people, we lost about 12 or maybe 15 souls. People fell away. And every single one of them, they talk about, oh, this, this brother did that, this sister did that, da, 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 this is how I felt. And then when you ask him, hey, when was the last time you prayed and read? And they go, oh, I didn't do that this week. Um, or maybe they say, I, I did that yesterday. I've been doing that every week. It's like, okay, how long do you pray for? Five minutes? It's like, okay, yeah. You see, the only thing that's going to help you be saved, stay faithful, and not be a little lost, is when you continuously go to the Bible. When you continuously have people around you that challenge you, that love you enough to tell you that you're not awesome. Come on. <laughs> I've had a lot of that, right? <laughs> um, but in conclusion, guys, you've got to ask yourself, are you going in the wrong direction? Right. The other challenge I want to give you is I want you to ask someone that knows you well. Whether you're visiting or whether you're a member of the church, ask someone in the church. You know, if you ask someone in the world, sometimes they, you know, they fluff around, right? But if, you ask, but if you ask the disciples, they'll tell you straight up. Ask someone that knows you well, am I heading in the wrong direction? Point number one, are you on the run? Where are you running to? Time to run to God. Point number two, are you a little lost? Being a little lost will eventually equal to being lost. And I love you guys so much. That's all I say.